Welcome to From AMIA to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director of the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours Programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, we hear reflections from the group representing the United States on the battlefield tour. My name is Abigail Smithson. I am part of Team USA. During our research, I was focusing on the U.S. soldier preparation and their training and emotionally preparing for the war. They were going to fight for something they believed in. For the women and children, that's how they saw it. They were defending their freedom. As the Americans were preparing for defending their freedoms and what they believed in, the nations that were involved from the start knew the death and the sadness and the grief that was yet to come for them and they knew that their life was going to change for the worse once they got back, if they got back. Hello, I'm Nick Manji, I'm from Team USA. What I researched for the Amiens 100th anniversary event that we're at right now was all like the key facts and supporting data for the project that we were doing. The thing I found really interesting for us living in Michigan, a lot of people from the northern U.S. would go to Canada to fight, even though the United States wouldn't let people go and fight for their country. They would leave their country, go get citizenship somewhere else, and fight under another country's name because they were that passionate about protecting others. My name is Luisa. I'm from California. I'm on the United States team. We did the photography research. One of the photos that I researched was a World War I memorial with a little boy standing in front of it. And so what really spoke to me when we went to the graveyards a lot of the time were the ages and there were some that were like 17 year old kids, 18, 23. These people sacrificed their youth so that other people could have theirs. Because I'm 17, so people my age were in these trenches, were dying for freedom, for world peace. Hi, my name is Megan Burton. I'm from Team USA. I'm from Newbury, Michigan. I focused on personal accounts, individuals in the war. One of the people that I studied, his name was Harry Shankman, and he had a really intriguing quote that I really liked. It basically explained you never knew what was going to happen. You never knew when your next step was going to be your last. And that made it all real for me. They lived every day to the best that they could and fought for what they believed in. Coming to France for the first time ever, it was really interesting to me to see how other countries live and the different culture and learning how they live their everyday life and how they commemorate their involvement. My name is Rajit Singh and I'm from Irvine, California, Team USA. And my research I looked at trench art. It's bizarre. You would think about art when you're in a trench and you don't know when the next guy is going to come to shoot you or if it's going to be a bullet that just comes at your head. The soldiers, they made leaves on top of the bullets that were there to take their life away. And what they did with that bullet, they put a flower on it. Hi, I'm Lily. I'm from Team United States. Our team was responsible for researching how we remembered the war. So for me, I focused on women's rights. During the war, 
because a lot of males were conscripted, females were actually able to do what was previously male-dominated jobs, and they actually were a part of the war effort too. So it allowed them to have a lot more movement and credence, and they were able to use that to get their suffrage in 1920. I'm now in France for the Amiens 100 commemoration. What kind of inspired me the most during this trip is when we were reading about one of the Allied soldiers who, after one of the battles, was walking the field and he saw a lot of wounded German soldiers who were dying. He stopped by each one of them and he took his cross and he said a prayer for them in German. One of the soldiers kissed his hand as he was giving back the cross and he said that if it was just an hour earlier, that person would have been his enemy. What hit me there was that so much of the time we focus on our differences and we kind of try to demonize our enemies and we don't like to admit that the other side's also human and that we actually have more similarities than we would like to admit. I'm Mansi Solanki from the USA team. I feel that America was the final push that really gave the allies the motivation to keep on going, to know that they're backed up by someone, to know that no matter what, they have the upper hand. And because of that, they really gave it their all. At Amiens, it was a matter of time before everything fell into place and the Germans were depleted of their supplies, their men. When we went to many memorials around the place, I saw the amount of shells that were being used. If one person was slaughtered by artillery, then back home, everyone is affected by this. Germany, France, America. Differences are natural. It's our human tendency. And if we want to get our point across, we usually find violence a very good technique. Even though weapons are used, it doesn't necessarily mean that we all agree with it. Could it be avoided? We'll just have to see. History does repeat itself. If anything, I feel like this meeting of all the different nations together, it's a good way to just make sense of many situations. We really learned that even though we speak different languages and have so many barriers, we can really connect over just these past few days. And I think this is one step towards peace itself. My name is Sam Massey from the USA team. Part of the research that I did was the lead up to the Battle of Amiens. What I got from it was that in the spring of 1918, the Germans launched the offensive of Operation Michael. It was a wild success because they kept taking land rapidly, but they moved too quickly for their supplies to reach up to them. So they had the position, just not the equipment to hold the position or the food. Coming here, I found a lot of really cool things about what happened in some of the battles. Like at the one battle at Hamel, they tricked the Germans into putting on their gas masks so they'd be impaired because gas masks do impair you when you wear them. Before the battle, they sent out smoke and gas at the same time, so the Germans got accustomed to seeing both the smoke and the gas. So if they saw smoke, they'd put on gas masks. On the day of the battle, they sent out smoke, but not gas. So the Allied soldiers could go charge in without the gas mask impairment, whereas the Germans had that handicap or like how the Australians had a gun that was originally a naval gun, but they equipped it to be able to be used on a rail cart. Also, the architecture around here is just beautiful. War memorials are really good. We don't have a lot of stuff like this back in America. Hello, I'm Lorna Gage, and I'm part of the USA team. Part of the research I did was on Herman Weimer, he was a lieutenant, and he was an American. Something I learned from the writings he did was he was very focused on his soldiers, and he was just focused on them as individuals and not the big picture and what he was fighting for. Coming here, you really see that the commemoration isn't about who lost and who won. It's mostly just about the soldiers that lost their lives and how it affected the communities and the countries that were involved seeing all the memorials and how beautiful they are, it really shows how important it was to put something beautiful where something so horrible happened. My name is Sam Adele and I am on the American team for the AMIA memorial event. Before I'd come to France, I had studied how America had honored soldiers that had fought in the war and had lost their lives. One of the most powerful ways they had done it was 
in Pasadena, California, they erected a flagpole that at the base had a very ornate carving of soldiers and nurses. It struck me because, at least in the United States, flagpoles are normally not altered. And so it hit me that the American government was willing to make the change to honor those who had fallen. In France, I was interested to see how other nations had honored their fallen. To me, it was quite interesting to see how the cultures of each nation could influence that, like German memorials being more plain than, say, British. What I mean by that is that Germans, for example, have plain black crosses and not much else in the cemeteries, while in French and British ones they have ornate gravestones and pillars and structures in the back to make it more prominent. You have been listening to From Amiens to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, we hear reflections from the group representing Canada on the Battlefield Tour.